Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 14th episode of Informed and Engaged. Today, I'm thrilled to have the finest award-winning journalist from Michigan, Steve, Hen Steve Henderson and Nolan Finley. Steve and Nolan, I first met them uh, about four or five years ago in Detroit when over a, what was billed as a whiskey hour, they <laughs> used this as an opportunity to bring together different views of what was happening um, on the ground in different political perspectives to the major challenges and major opportunities in the city of Detroit. This has grown into the Detroit Civility Project, which is a new effort which has allowed Steve and Nolan, who bring very different political perspectives, but have managed to really um, have great conversations with each other and to facilitate great conversations among others with different, different views. And they have facilitated many, many uh, conversations over the last year with the Detroit Civility Project. And here we are the day before the first presidential debate. And one of the key questions that we're gonna talk about today is, is the national media getting it right? Are the polls getting it right? Both Steve and Nolan are journalists on the ground in a key battleground state in Michigan, and they're going to tell us what they're hearing and what is their, their perspective. So first, let me tell you a little bit about Steve and a little bit about Nolan. Um, Steve is a Pulitzer Prize winning former editorial editor of the Detroit Free Press, who is the founder and the editor-in-chief of Bridge Detroit, which is one of the most exciting new not-for-profit journalism organizations in the country. So with Bridge Detroit, Bridge Detroit is not only committed to delivering great reporting for the people of Detroit, it is committed to informing that reporting by truly listening and really being on the ground and listening to what it is, the information, the reporting that people in community really need. Steve is a very busy person. Steve also has a morning, a morning, um, a morning uh, radio show on WDET. And Nolan and Steve, as I uh, mentioned, they have uh, many projects together, including a community affairs show called One Detroit on Detroit Public Television. Nolan has been at the Detroit News for more than 40 years. And for the last 20 years, he has been the editor of the editorial page and one of the most well-read columnists across Michigan. So please join me for what is to be a lively, a robust, but a completely civil conversation about, <laughs> about uh, what is happening in, in today's uh, politics uh, <laughs> in the final weeks of the, of the campaign. So Nolan, let me begin with you. Yes. So, um, so the national media certainly uh, got it wrong last time. Yes. So did the polls. Uh, the polls, the most recent polls that I saw today had uh, Joe Biden up by almost 10 points in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, Michigan remains a key battleground um, state. Does that, does the poll findings, does the, what is being recorded um, out of Washington and New York, is that consistent with what, what you're hearing and seeing on the ground? Well, as you mentioned, a lot of, lot of the national media, a lot of folks got it wrong in 2016, including Steve and me. So, you know, we're very cautious. I'm very cautious this time about how, how to read what's going on. Donald Trump should never have won Michigan in 2016. Hillary Clinton should have never won. And Donald Trump should not win in 2018 based on uh, what we know about the state, its history and presidential elections and everything else. But we all saw what happened in 2016. I've been trying to listen more this time and watch things 
a lot more um, carefully this time before uh, launching off into prognostication uh, that may not hold up. I still think it still feels to me like anything can happen here. Uh, I don't believe there's a 10 point lead, but there very well could be. Race also could be tied or Trump could be ahead. I mean, there is a lot of enthusiasm for the president. I wrote Sunday seeing yard signs everywhere, giant yard signs. I think you mentioned you saw the same thing near your home. Um, that may mean a lot, may not mean much at all, because I believe Donald Trump is driving turnout on both sides of the ticket. I don't think there's a lot of enthusiasm for Joe Biden in, in Michigan, in, in Metro Detroit. There was not a whole lot of uh, enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton four years ago, but I don't think there's as high as negatives for Biden this time as we saw for Clinton last time. And if you look at what happened here in 2018, where Democrats just uh, turned out in droves and took seats they never should have took, I mean, I don't know that conditions have changed that much in over the last two years uh, in terms of democratic enthusiasm to vote. I think what has changed over the last two years is Republican enthusiasm to vote has increased. And so I'd be very hesitant to put Michigan into one column or the other at this point. Thank you, Nolan. And just before the, sto the show began, Steve, we were talking about turnout. And as Nolan said, um, the president is driving turnout on both sides of the aisle. What has to happen for, um, for Joe Biden to win? Um, well, you know, as Nolan said, uh, 2016 was an anomaly in a lot of ways in, in Michigan, or, or at least something we hadn't seen uh, in a really long time or before. Uh, and there are a couple of different dynamics at work. One was uh, the, the vote in Macomb County, which is uh, the sort of northeast suburbs of Detroit, uh, which are... Um, uh, pretty pretty working class, blue collar uh, in a lot of ways, uh, and kind of a bellwether for working class and blue collar votes, not just in the state, but uh, in the country. This is the home of the, the Reagan Democrats. That's where that, that phrase was coined uh, in the 1980s, as Democrats who crossed over and voted for Ronald Reagan for president. Um, we saw them in 2016 after having voted two times for Barack Obama. Uh, very strongly, uh, we saw them switch and vote for, for Donald Trump. Um, and so that was unexpected. Uh, uh, was not, there was nothing in the polls that said that that was going to happen in the numbers that it did. Uh, so that had a, a lot to do with it. And then the flip side of that, of course, is the vote in Detroit, uh, where you have, uh, you know, an overwhelming Democratic advantage. Um, any Democrat who's going to win the state of Michigan really needs a, a very strong turnout here in, in Detroit. Um, and if you get it, uh, you're, likely, you're likely to win. Um, in 2016, there were 20,000 fewer votes cast for president uh, in the city of Detroit than there had been in 2012 uh, or, or 2008. Um, and so the, the, the combination of the undervote in Detroit and the switch of votes uh, in Macomb County uh, delivered a very narrow victory, 10,000 votes statewide uh, to Donald Trump. Um, you know, I think uh, if you're Donald Trump, um, that's, that's going to be a hard trick to repeat. Uh, I think he probably, he, he has a good shot to win Macomb County um, again, but probably not as heavily as he did in 2016. Uh, but more, more importantly, uh, the motivation to get voters out in Detroit is just going to be um, much more, um, uh, much more focus of, of the Democratic side. Um, voting has already started here in the city of Detroit, uh, because one of the things we did in, uh, in 2018 in Michigan is, is start no reason absentee voting. You can vote absentee if, if you just feel like it. Um, uh, and that means there are early votes being cast by people who are not showing up on election day. 
uh, the number of people who have gone to these, they've got boxes uh, set up around the city to collect ballots. Uh, the first day that they were open, uh, there was just a real crush of people. Um, uh, they are now talking about how to make sure that uh, there, are, there are officials near those, those boxes to make sure that uh, they're available to people and that the lines don't get out of control and things like that. So early sign is that you're going to have a strong vote in Detroit, uh, which, Demo which you know, Joe Biden um, absolutely benefits from. But, but as Nolan said, you know, anything can happen. And, and I think this year has taught us all uh, not to not to predict what's what's coming tomorrow, right? <laughs> Let alone uh, in in forty days. So uh, I, I would say Joe Biden has a, a clear advantage. That's what you're seeing in the polls. Uh, but if he can't get voters out the way that he needs to, then then he won't win. And Jennifer, I'd add too that you've always got to be careful with the polls, particularly I think this year. I mean, Cato had a survey out said more than fifty percent of Americans are afraid to say publicly uh, who they're voting for. And that's 77% of Republicans say that. So, you know, you can't get as good a, as, as good a feeling, I think, as, uh, you know, journalists. And we've got to get out there and, and stop, stop making assumptions about how people are feeling, how people are voting. Start actually talking to people. I saw a piece uh, moved today on, by the AP on the New York Times uh, tax story that said, well, this will hurt Donald Trump or blue collar workers. Blue collar workers won't like this. On and on about blue collar workers without ever quoting one. And, you know, I think we might be uh, making some of the same mistakes we made last time into not getting, not getting out and doing the legwork. And Nolan, we've talked about this over the years about the deep cuts at the Detroit News, at the Free Press, and when you and I began um, working as reporters, we were out there, you know, covering meetings. We were right. there at the school board meetings, at the city council um, meetings, at the water authority um, meetings. And, and how are journalists, how are journalists doing, local journalists in Michigan at the news, how are they uh, doing that kind of reporting when there have been so many cutbacks? Well, the cuts are one thing, and then the COVID restrictions are another. It's hard to get out and talk to people face to face. Uh, there's fewer opportunities to meet people where they live and work and interact. Uh, obviously, you know, we don't have the resources. No one has the resources anymore to staff elections the way we used to, where there's uh, a reporter for, for the Democratic candidate and a Republican candidate, and, and you know, we're following both all over the state and every race as a reporter assigned to that race. I mean, that's, you know, 70s and 80s. That's not uh, the 2000s and uh, 2000s and 20s. I mean, it's been a long time since we've been trying to, to stretch fewer people across more, uh, more beats and more stories. So, you know, there, but, you know, the technology does help. And, you know, we've made some, some tremendous gains in technology and that's mitigated some of that. But we're not getting out as far and wide as we used to in terms of talking to, talking to the people. And in terms of technology, one of the um, really innovative approaches in Detroit, of course, is outlier media, which has uh, played a major role during COVID and really um, helping capture through text messages and text message exchanges, um, people's questions and, and people's concerns. And Steve, how has Bridge Detroit worked with outlier media to tell the stories that come from that way of listening? Yeah, um, uh, Outlier was one of the, the partners that helped us put together Bridge Detroit. Um, and uh, since we've launched, there's been, uh, you know, an effort to try to continue that work and, and figure out how uh, the, the information they're getting can guide uh, our reporting. Um, one of the things that, that has been true, of course, since uh, we launched Bridge Detroit is the, the overwhelming um, concerns among Detroiters about COVID. Uh, COVID is a, is a very um, different animal 
uh, in this city than it is in lots of other places. So the number of losses uh, that we've had, I mean, I, I, there's no one in this city who, who doesn't have somebody uh, that they've lost. Uh, uh, I know eight people uh, who are dead uh, uh, since March 15th uh, because of COVID. Uh, and that's a small number compared to a lot of folks. Uh, and so that has really dominated uh, outliers focus this year. Uh, and it's dominated the things that people are talking about. And it's not just the, the health concerns. Uh, it's the other things that have come with it. It's the economic concerns. So the housing issues that have come up uh, because of COVID have really uh, just crystallized how much of a housing crisis we were in before this started, uh, which I think a lot of people were not necessarily aware of. Um, uh, the, the, the jobs picture here in, in Southeast Michigan. I mean, the, the, the number of people who are just not able to work or whose jobs have gone away, um, which pushes them further into, into poverty and uh, despair. Uh, the, the work of both Outlier and Bridge Detroit um, since COVID started has really been focused on those things and trying to you know, trying to lift up the stories that Detroiters themselves have to tell about uh, about all of these things. Um, uh, you know, fronting uh, Detroiters' stories in in particular. You know, the other the other thing that's really happened um, uh, that not everyone is talking about uh, is the violence this summer in Detroit has just been. Um, uh, at a level that we have not seen in recent years. Uh, more shootings, more murders uh, than, than we are even used to in a city where that's, that's just a part of life. Um, and so uh, some of the effort has been to also really focus on what's going on, uh, what's, what's happening that's causing that, and what are the effects of it. Um, just a few weeks ago, at Bridge Detroit, we published uh, a story that fronted the stories of mothers who have lost children um, uh, to, to murder in the city. Uh, that's a story that comes directly from uh, people themselves, the Detroiters themselves, uh, the things that they're experiencing and gives them a platform that to be honest, uh, they didn't have before in media, uh, other media hasn't really focused on it from, from that side of things. And so, you know, we continue to, to try to figure out uh, our way forward with not just Outlier, but lots of other partners here uh, in Detroit, trying to make sure that, that the stories that Detroiters have to tell themselves are the ones that, uh, that are getting air. And tell me how the Detroit Civility Project is working and how it may, how you're helping facilitate conversations around these important policy issues and perhaps away from the politics and that's just driving polarization, just to get at some of these policy solutions. And you've been writing as, the, as a columnist and as the editor of the editorial page Nolan, for so many years, mm -hmm. how, um, how is the Detroit Civility Project helping these important issues get addressed? Well, it's a small effort we hope leads to big things uh, in, our, in our community. And you know, we're not trying to uh, resolve all the disagreements. We're not trying to bring everybody into one place. Uh, but what we are trying to encourage people to do is not lose their minds over politics and not uh, find it so easy to hate people who don't uh, agree with you because we know what that leads to. You know, that sort of uh, hate leads to dehumanization and then that leads to all kinds of bad things in our society. And, you know, I've come to believe anything is possible in terms of things going bad and going wrong. When the COVID hit, uh, we didn't know how we would continue this project. We had just basically started it uh, with the help from Delta Dental Plans of Michigan. Uh, we had got this underway in January, I, th I believe. And then of course had to shut it down in terms of in-person sessions. 
uh, in February, but we very quickly found that this Zoom format works very well for the Civility Project in that uh, uh, we really do find it to be, you know, it sounds funny, but more intimate than the in-person uh, sessions were in greater participation, greater engagement. And, you know, basically we're just trying to, based on what we've been able to do together over our relationship over the last dozen years, trying to, to show people that you can have disagreements and passionate discourse uh, without, with people who disagree, somebody you disagree with, without um, sort of letting that deteriorate into something very negative and very hateful, that you can be friends across the political divide. And we need people to have relationships across that divide because what we have to have is uh, productive discourse that leads to pragmatic solutions. And you don't get there if you're just standing there uh, in your own self-righteousness, screaming across the divide, calling names across the divide. This has really been an awful year for civility. And we're just trying to make uh, what difference we can in this community. And, you know, we've actually now started doing it across, you know, outside of Michigan, across the country, talking to groups. So, uh, yeah. Again, Zoom makes that easy. Yeah. And how do you address systemic racism in your conversations when you have the President of the United States running a very clear strategy to, <laughs> uh, it's very, very clear, um, to not only um, his base, but, uh, but beyond his his space. How do you how do you address that? I remember. I still remember Steve, uh, the front page editorial that you produced when you were editorial page editor at the Free Press. After uh, I think it was then candidate Trump um, called on the Muslim um, ban, and of course uh, Michigan has a very large um, Muslim um, community. So so how do you how do you just talk about racism. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, um, one thing that Nolan and I always say is that civility does not mean avoidance. Civility does not mean staying away from uh, topics that we see differently or, or that uh, we have different passions about. Uh, and, and there's no way to have a conversation about this election. There's no way to have a conversation about this president. There's no way to have a conversation about the massive movement that we have seen take place, uh, coalesce this year uh, around police brutality and systemic racism without talking about uh, how it spreads uh, to, to other parts of our society. Uh, and, and so we just do it. And, and that does not mean that we, um, you know, like I said, it doesn't mean we just get along. I mean, we get after each other and we have real genuine and deep disagreements about, uh, about these things. We have uh, things that we just can't see eye to eye on. Uh, and, and there are times when our conversations about this are passionate. There are times when they are angry. Uh, there, there are times when those, those conversations uh, get to the point where it seems like it may be uh, uncivil. And, and we're not saying that there's anything wrong with that. We're saying people need to be able to do that. You need to be able to confront these things in that way, but you need to be able to do it uh, inside uh, the context of a relationship that itself is civil. Nolan and I respect each other. Uh, we actually like each other. Uh, and, and even when we get into, uh, you know, heated debates and angry exchanges over things, uh, the, the context of that relationship is more important than whatever it is that we're, we're fighting about. And I think that's an agreement uh, that's understood between the two of us um, and that we don't, um, you know, we never walk away permanently from the conversation. Um, uh, we talk about these things, we argue about these things, um, but we are always um, willing to listen to each other and to, to have that exchange without it coming to, to blows uh, or something like that. So, 
And what we talk about what we, when, we, when we're addressing a group is you have to, we ask people, um, this is an interactive, it's not a lecture. Um, it's an interactive, these sessions are interactive. And we ask people to, you know, before you get into the really difficult, dangerous conversations, sit down with a person that, that you'd like to have a relationship with, but your views are keeping you apart and try to figure out that person. I mean, Steve and I did this. Uh, he hooked us up with StoryCorps uh, several years ago, four or five years ago. And we didn't sit there and talk back and forth about our, our, our different political positions or our policy disagreements. We had a conversation about who we are as people and what it was in our backgrounds and in our values that informed our decision making. What makes him a liberal, me a conservative? And once, if you start with that and try to get people uh, to reach an understanding about where the other person is coming from, you do develop a kind of respect, but more importantly, a trust in which you can have difficult uh, uh, conversations. Because, you know, because it's, it's our point that, you know, everybody comes to their opinions the same way. You know, they take the facts, they take the information, the data, apply their own values and experience to it and come up with opinion. If it's different than mine, if it's different than yours, doesn't make them evil, stupid, doesn't mean they hate America, doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean anything except that, you know, these, for the most part, are good people who have different experiences and values, perhaps, than, than the person that another person does. And you get to that point and people, you know, start becoming more comfortable and, and more honest in their conversations because, you know, as, as Steve said many times, uh, you know, learning to talk starts with learning to listen. Absolutely. And speaking of trust, of course, there has been declining trust in the news media, especially among um, Republicans. A recent Knight Gallup poll showed that there's agreement that the news media is critical. However, nearly half of those surveyed, including both Republicans and Democrats, believe the news media is, is biased. And of course, um, of course, nearly 71% of Republicans uh, do not have um, faith in the traditional uh, news media. Um, what, how might the Civility Project, what, what might journalists do to help rebuild trust in journalism? Well, I mean, I, I have different views of this, obviously coming from a conservative perspective in and reading stories that sometimes set my teeth on edge as well. Uh, I think the worst thing we can do as journalists is assume we don't have a problem, that it's their problem, a perception problem. And if we're okay saying, well, it's, it's, it's all right that half the people don't in the country don't trust us, and maybe even more than that, uh, don't trust us, then I think we have a real issue. Uh, I think we got to get back to our our, our values and our standards in this profession, I think we have to be, a, one, we have, have to stop making as many mistakes as we make uh, in this rush to be first. I think we need to be very judicious with the use of anonymous sources. I think they've caused us a lot of problems, particularly over the last four years. Uh, and I, you know, I just think good, solid reporting in the public interest will, uh, help rebuild trust. I think the worst thing we did as a profession, as an industry, is take the, the president's bait on this war between the, the White House and journalists. Uh, you know, we got, oh, you know, when did we ever care what a president thought of us? And we seem to be obsessively, uh, we care obsessively about how Donald Trump feels about us. You know, I think we just, we know how to do our jobs. I think we just do them and do them with, uh, you know, the, the values that have guided this profession, I think we, we restore trust. But there's always gonna be certain percentage of population that doesn't trust you because they don't like to hear, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear the truth. And, you know, so there's always gonna be a percentage. It shouldn't be as high as it is. And I think we've earned that. You know, one of the things I think is really key um, 
is the, and this is a, a, a you know, I think a, a national phenomenon is the, the trust in local news, right? And the relationships that are possible in local news uh, and, and the pulling away from those relationships that you've seen a lot of local news organizations have to do because of uh, a lack of resources, uh, but also kind of double down on in, in, some, in some cases. And I think that has as much to do with the lack of trust as anything. Um, when I grew up here in the, in the city in Detroit, uh, people thought of uh, the free press or the news, whichever paper you, you took at your house, as kind of a member of, uh, of the community. Uh, it, 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 there was a personality associated with it. There were faces and names associated with it. Sometimes there were people you knew. Um, I, I think there's so much less of that um, right now uh, right. than there used to be. And that makes people, uh, it makes people more wary. Um, you know, with Bridge Detroit, uh, one of the things that we are doing is kind of turning that on its head and saying, we're going to start with the relationship. We're going to start with the idea that, uh, that we're in touch with people, that we are asking them about their lives, and then we're going to try to uh, inform them about things and inform other people about things. And maybe that builds trust in a different way, kind of an old school way. Um, uh, but of course, there are all kinds of bells and whistles now that we have that we didn't have, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. But, but I, I think doubling down on that and saying that you've got to have a relationship with the people you call your readers or your listeners or your viewers um, is one of the things that media really needs to do to, to, to move that trust uh, needle in the, in the opposite direction. And Jennifer, you hit it right at the beginning in your opening question where you talked about, you know, back in the days when we were coming up and we were in the community, we were at those meetings. I think that is a crucial element that's missing in a lot of papers, big and small in this country now. Uh, we're not in the community. They don't see us visibly uh, there. Uh, they read our product perhaps, but they can't attach a face to the name as often as they did when we were at those kind of meetings you talked about. I think that was essential to build trust and to establish a relationship. I mean, many papers now don't even have publishers or editors. You know, their newsrooms, their business operations are run out of a corporate office. So you don't even have that figurehead going to, you know, the chicken dinners and, and you know, sitting on boards and establishing the, the institution uh, in a community. Uh, and I think you can, you can track the erosion of trust to the erosion of presence, just as Steve said. Yeah, absolutely. That whole role of community leadership has been has been lost in in so many uh, communities around the around the country. So we um, are open to take your uh, questions. Um, so please uh, put your questions in the chat, uh, and we'll get to them. We have a. Um, question from Brian Allman, who has, who, who notes that as we talk about civility, it's quite a challenge. It uh, must be to lead a civility project when at the time the um, president of the United States is not leading necessarily in the same um, manner. Well, um, <laughs> I always say to that, you know, uh, when did Donald be Trump become our our I ideal or who we emulate, uh, you know, what, what, I mean, a productive civil discussion in, in the sessions we leave starts with sort of losing this idea that you're right, you're all right, and the other guy's all wrong, you know, uh, the other person is, is, has nothing of value to add to the conversation. See, it starts with losing that self-righteousness, that smugness, and saying, okay, I want to talk to this person, not because I want to convert, or because I want to preach, because there's perhaps I might learn something, or I might gain some sort of understanding. So you have to start with that, that uh, some honesty in your goals. And if you're out to convert, I mean, I've been talking to Steve for a dozen years. I can change Steve and never will. And I've, I've stopped wanting to. It wouldn't be near as much fun if, if I converted him. But if you're out to convert, lecture, and 
you know, you have this, this smugness that, man, I'm the guy who's right. And the other guy's all the problems. There's a lot of problems coming from both sides of the political aisle. And you can say, well, we'll weigh it. But, you know, there's, it, it depending on who's, who's operating the scale is, uh, you know, how, how things will come out. I think your goal needs to be an honest conversation that leads to some sort, sort of um, learning something you didn't know. Yeah, I, and you know, I would say that the president's incivility is every bit the reason to try to to try to do something different and and talk about things in a different context. One of the things we talk about with the civility project is that you know none of us has control over what the president's going to do uh, or how people will react uh, to the president, but what we do have control over are the interactions that each of us has in our communities uh, with people who often we don't uh, agree with. Uh, and that's where we're asking people to, to kind of focus and say, is there a better way for me to have that exchange with my neighbor who I think uh, doesn't have the right idea about these things or the person at work who uh, is, is talking about stuff that I, that I don't agree with. Uh, the member of my family who uh, I think is, is nuts because they, they support this or that. Um, those are the things that I think each of us can, can really grab hold of and say, there's a different way to do these things and we can screen out some of the things that, that are happening at the national level. There's no question that this is the most uncivil chief executive we've seen in the history of the United States. I don't think there's any debate about that. I think even his supporters uh, would have to acknowledge that, 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 that you know, what he's doing is, is inappropriate. They just don't think it's the most important thing about him. Uh, but, but I think you've got to take that out of the equation in your own life uh, to be able to say, how can I, how can I relate to these these uh, these people in my life who uh, who just don't agree with me, who don't see things the way I do. Yeah, somebody else's incivility is no excuse for your own. And we've had too much of that, but, you know, yeah, but stuff going on. And, uh, you know, we're responsible for our own behavior and for maintaining uh, decency in our own relationships. And how might the Detroit Civility Project address the very important national reckoning that's taking place now on, on systemic racial discrimination, on racial in, injustice. Well, and, one thing, and you know, I'm, obviously we're not going to uh, present our, uh, you know, our participants with, uh, okay, here's how you have to feel. What we want them is to be able to talk to each other uh, about it, to try to gain understanding and un unfortunately a lot of people that you know there's a lot of danger in having that conversation there's a lot of risk you know a lot of people have good people have said the wrong thing and have suffered some some very harsh uh consequences because of it uh and so you get people pulling further and further back in their shell and say and instead of having you know a, a conversation that leads to understanding and information Oh, yeah, 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 I agree, okay. And, you know, they're not having the sort of, sort of um, uh, those sort of discussions. Instead, you know, they're, they're harboring whatever resentments or, or, or um, you know, negative feeling. They're harboring inside, sharing them only with the people. They're certain to agree with them. That sort of thing, you drive that underground and it festers and it becomes something ugly. I mean, we want people to be able to talk about um, race. And, you know, we... We see a lot of people who um, very honestly want to reach some sort of healthy place, and he but are afraid to have the discussions to get there. They don't know how to ask the questions, and uh, you know they're afraid to express their own views, so they could be so those views can be debated and and better understood. And so just trying to take the fear out of interactions. And again, that starts with building the trust that you know you can have. Yeah. You say something, it's not going to be a gotcha moment. 
Well, and there's also, you know, there's also some modeling here. I mean, uh, in most of the sessions that we've had, uh, this has come up uh, because it is the, I, I keep saying that when history looks back at 2020, um, it will look equally at this movement that has, has grown out of uh, the, 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 the issues of police brutality and, and um, systemic racism uh, as it does at, at the pandemic. Uh, I mean, 23 million people have, have participated in BLM uh, events uh, in six months. Uh, this is, this is the, the thing that will define uh, this generation of young people. It will define our politics uh, for years to come. And we are, um, you know, um, in our civility sessions, Nolan and I uh, get after each other about it. I mean, we don't agree uh, on an awful lot of things about this. Uh, we see it fundamentally differently, partially because of who we are and where we're from, uh, but also uh, because of the, the, the way we come at these things. And the, the discussions we have, uh, the arguments we have uh, are, are, you know, passionate and, and sometimes even bitter. Uh, but at the same time, what we're modeling is that you can have those arguments, that you can have those disagreements uh, and not do damage to the interaction between the two people that, um, that uh, neither one of us ever walks away and says, well, I'm done with that. I'm done with that person. I'm not talking to that person anymore about these things. Uh, we always come back and say, all right, well, well, we'll go at it again. And I think that is a critical part of uh, what, what media needs to make possible uh, during all of this is uh, the ability for people to, 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 to find the, 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 the space to do that with each other uh, and not let it devolve into, uh, into destructive behavior or destructive interaction. And there's a moment here, um, I, you know, I think as Steve expressed, there's a very important moment here and an opportunity that risk being squandered if we can't engage people in productive conversations that lead to, you know, the, the sort of pragmatic solutions that we're all looking for. Uh, and, and people have to sit down and, and talk. And of course, uh, journalism can play a major role in increasing public understanding as, as so many great books that have just been published uh, in the last year on this topic. I'm um, in the middle of reading Isabel Wilkerson's um, mm. incredible book um, titled Cast. And my goodness, if we had a national book club, I guess Oprah Winfrey <laughs> does have a national book club. Um, just how in Isabel uh, worked at the Times as a just incredible reporter and um, did many stories out of out of Detroit as a national mm -hmm. correspondent. Um, and she's just uh, it's just an example of just incredible reporting and great writing and yeah. and what are the stories? I guess that's the other thing that I ask: are what are the stories that as journalists we should be doing? We should be um, really looking for. Um, for our local uh, journalism um, outlets to do to help increase um, public understanding of what systemic racism is so that people can better understand uh, the systems over many years that yeah. have just upheld um, um, in injustice. And um, so it's so, so, so a, a, a good example of that, um, the radio show that I host on uh, public radio here in, in Detroit, each summer we have a book club uh, where we ask the community to read with us. Uh, um, this year, uh, we chose Invisible Man by Ralph Allison, uh, which mm -hmm. is this wonderful tale of the origins of systemic racism, the way that it travels from south to north in this country, the way that it travels across time. Uh, and, you know, it was a, there was a little bit of a risk in picking a book like that, as old as it is, um, and as obscure as it is to a lot of people. I mean, there are a lot of our listeners who've never even heard of it. Um, but we had an incredible summer of conversation on air, 
online, uh, on Zoom, uh, where we would uh, get together to talk about that book and other books. Uh, we had 600 people in a Facebook group uh, all summer wow. talking wow. about Invisible Man and the different chapters and things like that. We had authors like Colson Whitehead join us on the on the air to talk about their own work and how it uh, dovetails with the uh, with Invisible Man. Uh, we tried to get Isabel late this summer. She's a little busy. She's going to come on. I hope in the winter uh, to talk about it as well. But I mean, that's a huge role that local media play in in all of this is exposing people. The number of people who told me <clears throat> during this book club that they did not know about this book, that they had not mm. read it before and really had not heard of it before was staggering. Uh, and that, you know, just the exposure, just letting them take a, take a crack at it and see what it's like is, uh, is one of the, I think it's one of the roles that we, we really have to have local media playing right now. And Jennifer, I also think people have reached the point where they're uh, ready for action. Okay. Yes. We've yes. Talked about this and talked about this and talked about this. What are the specific things we're looking to do to bring, um, you know, equality uh, across across all areas of our society? I mean, I, as a conservative and somebody who speaks to the business community, I've always tried to position this as an economic issue. That having a permanent underclass is bad for the economy. It's bad for business, and people respond to that. We've also tried to pitch it as, you know, conservatives have embraced for years now education reform. They haven't always gotten it right, but it is a, uh, it has been a core issue. And so this, this idea of uh, the role education plays in keeping people down and in uh, working against economic empowerment. Uh, and also now, you're seeing conservatives uh, leading in many places, particularly in Michigan, this effort at criminal justice reform, that this idea that we pushed in the 80s and 90s that we had to lock millions of people up to have a safe society has not worked. In fact, it's worked to, to create the conditions for criminal, criminal activity because it's fueled poverty. And it's fueled, uh, you know, a disappearance of, of men in our community who should be there contributing to their communities and their families. And so those are things people can get their hands on and understand and changes that they can make. And I think it's, we, it's, it's time we reached a point where we start pushing for that sort of change and talking about how that sort of change comes about. I mean, we now have... Uh, a major criminal justice reform uh, movement moving or, or legislative piece of legislation package of legislation moving through the Michigan uh, legislature most bipartisan piece of legislation I think we've seen around here in years that will have the most impact you know things like that start actually happening and you can build momentum for change but we've got to move beyond talk and into action so that seems like a perfect answer to one of the questions here. How do you evaluate the effectiveness of your approach? And if so, how? And it's action, right? It's spurring people it's to that. action. It's that. And it's, you know, very much, this is very much a grassroots project. I mean, uh, in many ways. I mean, if we can get people to come back to dinner again together at the Thanksgiving table, you know, that would be a nice mm -hmm. accomplishment too. I mean, it's not all... Macro. <laughs> and there's a, um, a question here of race and and the fact is is that something is hard to listen to um, and it does it does not make it not true sorry the double um, negative here so <laughs> people are looking for you know when something's true, when it's true, it can be extraordinarily difficult to listen to. And when, when can people get, uh, when can black Americans get the truth and reconciliation? 
that needs to come out of these conversations and these and these actions and yeah. how might conversation get us there or these types of conversations get um so you know i don't know the answer to that i don't know how it how it gets from there to the truth and reconciliation that we need i do know that we won't have truth and reconciliation without that conversation though. I know that that conversation is one step along the way to, to getting things to, to, to be better. That the, there's no way to do it um, without being able to exchange ideas uh, in a way that is not resulting in destructive behavior. And I'm somebody who, you know, and this is a, a place where Nolan and I do disagree. But I absolutely understand the violence that um, that uh, people are drawn to in response to systemic racism and police brutality. I have felt at different times this year absolutely drawn to the idea that uh, that there there has to be some retribution for some of what's going on, and that uh, uh, that that violence is a, a means of expression of um, of liberty. Uh, that that's not a radical notion to me. Uh, it's actually the notion that started this country uh, 240 some years ago as well. Um, uh, but but that violence also has to lead to um, to some way to, to to craft a country. We all got to live here. We all got to live together in this country. Uh, and in order to craft a, a, a better republic that is more respectful of majority uh, and, and minority interests, um, uh, we've got to be able to have a conversation and, and talk about really difficult things um, like race and like the history of, uh, of racism in this country. Um, I, again, I don't know how you get there and it, it may be that violence is part of that path too, I don't know. Um, but you won't get there without conversation. You will not get there without healthy, uh, exchange of ideas. And again, um, you know, this is what we often say is that Steve and I uh, rarely disagree on outcomes, where we want to end up, uh, but often agree on approaches. And this, as he said, is is one of those areas uh, after the, the, the killing of um, George Floyd and the start of these um, marches and the BLM uh, visibility, it's 70 some percent of white Americans saying, I'm with you, this is wrong, we gotta fix this. It's now down below 50% and I would blame the images of the ongoing violence and, and, and what have you in our cities that don't seem to be headed toward any sort of closure or purpose. Uh, and, and again, I think that's at the risk of squandering an opportunity here because when have you ever seen 70 some percent of white Americans say, yeah, I support this racial justice movement. That was an opportunity that I fear is slipping away uh, because we're giving people an excuse to turn away from, from you know, where they started. Well, there's much to learn from Detroit's history, but, of know, course. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. Steve? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we've seen over and over. We've seen this uh, in this country before, uh, and and the truth is that um, I mean I, we could argue for hours about whether this is actually truly a violent move. It's not. Uh, there are, there are some uh, marginal instances of violence that have been blown up. I think for the purpose of of, of undermining uh, the movement itself. Uh, but but Nolan's right that the reaction among white Americans has been to kind of abandon this. Uh, but I would also say that we're at a point where I don't think it matters what my, white America thinks about this. Uh, I, this is not a popularity contest. This is not a democratic question. Uh, the oppression that black and brown people face in this country is going to stop. Uh, and black and brown people are going to make sure that that happens. It'd be great if white America came along with us, um, but I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think that's a key ingredient. And that may be a key ingredient to the solutions on the other side of us getting rid of all of this uh, to coming up together around a new 
kind of paradigm in this country or a new country, uh, you know, a new republic that, that is configured really differently uh, than what we see now. But I think that, that the thing that's clear and that we are making clear is this will stop uh, and it will stop one way or another. Well, thank you, Nolan and Steve, so much for joining us today. And I hope we can get you um, back together here um, after November 3rd and, and would love to learn more about how the civility project can be taken um, beyond Detroit to have these really important conversations about politics and about race and about our future. Thank you, Jennifer. We have a website. I never can remember the, the URL. Steve, do you, do you remember it? Yeah, and I think we've put it in the, um, um, in the chat here. <laughs> yep. So, well, we, okay. <laughs> yep. I'm looking nope. it up right now, just in case. <laughs> you know, here it is. It's, it's GreatLakesCivilityProject.com. Oh, That's GreatLakesCivilityProject.com. So uh, please go to greatlakecivilityproject.com. We also have um, the link in our, in our chat to learn more about the Civility Project and how you might uh, take the Civility Project to your community. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. And I sure hope uh, to get back uh, to Detroit in the coming year and to... Uh, to uh, resume this conversation at one of your whiskey hours. You come in uh, for bourbon. There you go, or bourbon yeah. hours, bourbon hours. Yeah. There you go, there you we've go. Had to, we've had to put them on hiatus because of the <laughs> stupid pandemic. But. I'll get first. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah.